His uh, topic this morning is what the world wants from an Obama foreign policy. Gareth, the podium is yours. Well, thank you, Graham, for that very gracious and generous introduction. Thanks to Jim Matlack and Paul Diamond for your very gracious personal hospitality and organization since I've been here. And thanks to you all for the opportunity to talk to you at this very impressive community forum, which is quite unlike anything else I've been familiar with, not only in this country, but anywhere else in the world. And I want to congratulate everyone associated with it uh, for its longevity and for clearly the, the quality of the discussion and the dialogue. Let me plunge straight into the assigned topic by saying that what I think the world wants of Obama foreign policy is exactly what thoughtful Americans of the kind gathered here want of Obama foreign policy. And that's one conducted with decency, with humility, at least a reasonable amount of humility, I don't want to overstate the point, with a sense of responsibility, and above all, with intelligence. Just a few words of each of those things. Um, <laughs> When it comes to decency, this means not only avoiding the grotesqueries of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and secret rendition, but it means a foreign policy which is actually true to itself and which does reflect that basic sense of fairness and decency, which is so characteristic of the American people as a whole. It means a foreign policy which actually embraces the values which it promotes. And it means a foreign policy which is genuinely responsive to cries of distress from wherever they come. More about that later. Humility means, not just in the, the words of the founders, paying a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. Not only means recognizing that the United States can't by itself solve all the problems that negatively impact upon it, from terrorism to potential applicability of weapons of mass destruction to drug and people trafficking to outflows of refugees to health pandemics, and which all clearly need cooperative process, multilateral process, and confident willingness to work with international institutions. But it also means recognizing that the there is real virtue in a rule-based international order, and that the United States tries to stand above such a rule-based order at its peril. Barack Obama put it astonishingly succinctly and well, as he did so many other things in his book, The Audacity of Hope, when he said this, nobody benefits more than we do from the close, can't even, from the observance of international rules of the road. We can't win converts to those rules if we act as if they apply to everyone but us. When the world's sole superpower willingly restrains its power and abides by internationally agreed upon standards of conduct, it sends a message that these are rules worth following. Somehow I can't quite imagine George W. Bush having penned any similar words. They're very important ones and they capture that sense of institutional humility, which I think is a very, very important characteristic of foreign policy. The question of responsibility, which of course Barack Obama made the, the central mantra in many ways of his inaugural speech, it has to be acknowledged that of course the first responsibility of any country's foreign policy is to the national interests of that country itself. But these days, it's often necessary to resolve other countries' problems in order to be able to protect one's own national interests. And putting a point I've already made another way, countries that can't or won't stop mass atrocity crimes tend to be those who can't or won't stop the harboring of terrorism, the transit through their territory of weapons of mass destruction, the production of drug and people trafficking problems for others, the outflow of refugees which impact on others, health pandemics which impact on others. But beyond all that sense of responsibility to address those problems simply for national interest reasons, I think it does have to be acknowledged that great powers 
powers that are great both relatively and absolutely, great power carries with it extremely, especially great responsibilities. And the truth is that none of the biggest problems that are facing the world today, security problems as much as economic and environmental problems, can be solved without the United States. So that sense of responsibility for helping to address these problems, resolve them, is a critical element in US foreign policy. And finally, on intelligence. An intelligent foreign policy, to me, is one that embraces all the elements I've already mentioned. But it's also a little bit more than that. It's a policy that uses the instruments or the levers of power that any country has to maximum practical effectiveness. That means, I think, for the United States, using for a start its huge hard power, and the familiar terminology that Joe Nye has now given us, military power in particular, in a way that's not only principled but productive and not disastrously counterproductive as it obviously was in Iraq in 2003. It also means using the soft power that is such an important element these days in international relations. What you get through attraction rather than coercion or outright payment. It's a function, soft power, as we all have come to appreciate, of culture. It's and when a country's culture is seen, as the United States is by other countries, not least among young Iranians for a start. It's a function of a country's values when they're consistently applied and not misapplied, as was the commitment to democracy in Gaza a couple of years ago. Um, specific policies also are a function of soft power when they're seen as legitimate and helpful and attractive. And of course, the combination as we've now come to appreciate, of sensibly and effectively applied hard power and soft power is properly characterized as smart power. And that's, again, what I mean by the use of intelligence. Barack Obama, in his own power, is, of course, as the whole world is acknowledging, a huge soft power asset, that familiar combination of deeply unfamiliar combination, but we all now know about it, of black African father, white American mother, Indonesian education, Muslim, um, part of his name, uh, combined with the grace and the effectiveness of his personal communication style, um, is a deeply, deeply attractive uh, phenomenon, which is deeply, deeply influential already in the rest of the world. But I think Barack Obama also embodies within himself that very essence of, of smart power, a very clear pragmatism and appreciation of the scope and limits of hard power, and clearly a very, very deep intelligence in his ability to put all these different bits and pieces together. So in terms of what I think are the necessary characteristics of a foreign policy that will appeal to the rest of the world, those are the basic elements. But how does all this translate into specifics? specific responses to specific issues that the world wants to see. I wear basically three hats as I come to you today, as Graham said in introduction. The first is as president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, which is a worldwide conflict prevention and resolution organization active in some 60 countries. I've also been uh, co-chair of this Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty and very actively involved still in the whole question of genocide, mass atrocity crimes, and just published a book last year with Brookings Institution Press called The Responsibility to Protect, about which I want to say something more. And I'm also currently co-chair of a new international commission, which was established by Australia and Japan with a worldwide membership, including Bill Perry from the United States, to address the issue of non-proliferation and disarmament. And I want to give you some quick perspectives from each of those vantage points First of all, on, on just half a dozen issues. Um, first of all, on the two major non-alliance bilateral relationships that matter most for the rest of the world in America's conduct of them, namely with Russia and China. Um, secondly, on the two major current conflict arenas that the US just has to get right, the Middle East generally and Afghanistan, Pakistan. And also two major thematic areas, this issue of the responsibility to protect against mass atrocity crimes, and also the issue of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament that the world very badly wants to see the US getting right. I apologize for my late arrival um, as a result of multiple other commitments around the US in the last few days, 
which may mean that what I'm saying is a teensy bit repetitious of what some others have said, but maybe nonetheless this perspective will contribute to the, the wrap-up discussion that we have. First of all, on the relationship with um, Russia. This, the bilateral relationship between the US, this has not been a very healthy relationship for a long time. And I think we're now seeing the fruits of that in the renewed nervousness in the last year over Russian aggressive, chest-beating intentions, especially after its behavior in Georgia, but also over some of the energy policies that it's been pursuing. A nervousness which is most obviously felt in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, CIS countries, but also more generally is shared by a lot of others around the world who are asking just what the hell is going on here. My own view, and that of my organization, is that this tension and difficulty between US and Russia is in fact remedial. <coughs> it'll require some things to be done on the US side, it'll require some things to be done on the Russian side, and it'll require some things to be done by both together. On the US side, I think it does mean, frankly, the US giving Russia the respect which is due to it as a great nation, albeit one that's fallen on rather hard times, and which certainly was not evident during the triumphalism which clearly prevailed in the US after the end of the Cold War in those early years when Russia really was on its knees and before its energy uh, resources uh, got it back into business, at least when oil prices were higher than they are now. I think, apart from that general comment, more, much more specifically, I think it does mean um, the US in policy terms winding back uh, the provocation which is undoubtedly represented by the proposed missile defense uh, deployment to Poland and Czechoslovakia uh, last year. And more generally again, I think, although this is much more controversial, that it requires a fundamental rethink in the US and of course among its European allies as well, of what the whole Russia-NATO relationship is actually about. I suspect that the main problem here is not so much the NATO strategy of enlargement, but rather that the enlargement strategy stopped at Russia's own borders, with there never being any willingness, even conceptually, to embrace the possibility of Russia itself becoming a member of NATO in a re-characterized, redefined organization, which is a, a genuinely collective security one, rather than the living continuation of the Cold War. When you have deep down in the perceptions of all the players that what NATO is still really about is ensuring non, uh, the non-resurgence of the beast from the east, it's not entirely surprising that the beast from the east regards it as something of a self-fulfilling prophecy to, uh, to react in a rather aggressive way about those intentions. So I really do think we, we have to rethink all that, whether that's going to happen in the context of the NATO strategy review and everything else that's going on um, at the moment uh, remains to be seen. But it's a very important issue. On the Russian side, of course, there's lots of things the Russians have got to do themselves. And I think for a start, except just how much they overreached themselves uh, with their bit of adventurism in Georgia earlier this year. If they'd, as I've said to the Russians myself, if you'd just gone in and punched Misha Saakashvili on the nose for his own uh, overreaction to your provocation in South Ossetia and left it at that, most of the rest of the world would not have turned a hair. But expanding as you did into Georgian territory, expanding into Abkhazia and then carrying it a third bridge too far with the recognition of those two territories, you certainly comprehensively overreached yourself and made a lot of people very nervous. I think the Russians themselves acknowledged that and the way their own stock market reacted, the way in particular foreign investment dried up even before the current meltdown, and in the way they failed to get any support at all, even from their closest allies in the former Soviet Union and China and so on. Um, so we have the beginnings of a, uh, a willingness, I think, uh, by the Russians to, uh, to seriously re-engage their minds a little bit more concentrated by $40 oil as well uh, than was the case uh, last year. So far as what needs to be done by both sides, I think the overwhelming immediate need is to plunge into right now serious negotiations on strategic nuclear force reductions in the context of the extension of the START Treaty um, and, uh, and just ensure uh, 
major, major strategic force reductions, which are very much in both sides' interest to secure. And beyond that, to start engaging right now in a wider strategic dialogue uh, covering issues like missile defense, the common interest in guarding against any adventurism from Iran in the south in this respect, focusing on um, the de-alerting of strategic uh, and other nuclear forces on both sides, focusing on um, the decommissioning of tactical nuclear weapons. I want to say a little bit more about the whole nuclear issue a little later on. And I think focusing in that dialogue on something which is looming as of importance for the longer term, and that's the perceptions of very serious imbalances now in conventional force capability, which in an ironic, an ironic reversal of Cold War uh, dynamics, when the West was deeply worried about Russian conventional superiority, now it's absolutely the other way around, and that's one of the things that are keeping uh, the Russians in the nuclear game. Anyway, that's the stuff on Russia. On China, I think we have to um, appreciate that the, the US relationship, bilateral relationship with China, is simply the most important bilateral relationship in the world at the moment of any two countries. Not least, of course, because of the $1 trillion worth of uh, treasuries or other debt held by the Chinese. Um, and a lot of people are very nervously watching how this particular dimension will play itself out, and I know you've had some discussion of that already. There were some signs of bumps during the campaign period in the early days of this new administration uh, with China, uh, perhaps inevitably because China is probably the only country in the world that's really very enthusiastic about the George W. Bush administration and was worried about uh, what might succeed it. Uh, but things like Tim Geithner's rather unfortunate uh, use of the word manipulation to describe uh, China's approach to its uh, value of its currency. I think if you'd used a word like adjustment, again, not a term, uh, not a hair would have been turned. Um, but I think, I think these bumps have been already pretty obviously remedied by Hillary Clinton's um, prioritization of Asia and China in particular for her first visit. The first time that's happened since Dean Rusk uh, in 1961, which was the only other time in American history, as I understand it, when the Secretary of State's first visit has been to Asia. My own view um, about the future relationship with China is that China is gradually coming to terms with its own responsibilities as a great power, and it's not nearly as indifferent to global opinion generally in the United Nations Security Council and elsewhere, in Darfur, in Myanmar, as is sometimes assumed. I think things are changing in this respect, and it's very important in short, that the United States manage its relationship with China in a spirit, again, of respect and encouragement rather than anything in the nature of confrontation. Turning to the Middle East, what the world desperately wants is, of course, a solution once and for all to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has had poisonous ramifications throughout the whole Arab-Islamic world for as long as we can now remember. The tragedy of this situation is that until very recently, it was certainly possible to argue that the two-state solution to this problem was readily achievable if only the United States uh, engaged to the extent that was necessary, committed itself to the extent that was necessary, sat on heads to the extent that was necessary to bring the two sides together to find their way through uh, the dilemmas that each of them had in actually delivering on what both sides basically agreed was a sensible solution. Unfortunately, it's no longer clear that that's the case. With the events of the last couple of years, the terrible split in Palestinian ranks, the shift uh, to the right uh, in Israeli politics, that even with the, uh, the absolutely superb choice of uh, George Mitchell uh, to lead this ongoing process of, um, of negotiation, discussion, trying to pull things together, I think all of us just have to be rather pessimistic about what's achievable. It's evident to just about everyone in hindsight, although interestingly is still not being publicly conceded by anyone in high places in the US, that the single most disastrous mistake in the last couple of years by the international community was the failure to recognize the Palestinian government of national unity after the 2006 election, which of course had been actively encouraged by the United States. 
and a failure generally to engage Hamas and try to bring it in from the cold rather than to isolate it. My own organization wrote a report at the time based on our own conversations, and I certainly have had conversations with people like Halid Mashal and Damascus, and we're pretty familiar with what's going on and made our own judgments about what's doable here. But we reported uh, Hamas leadership as saying, let us govern or watch us fight. And that, frankly, was an accurate assessment of exactly the situation that unwound uh, as a result. The way forward to this is very, very difficult to see in the present environment, but I suspect, actually, that the best chances of getting movement back on the Israeli-Palestinian front, and maybe this was said already, yes, I don't know, by, uh, by tomorrow, but um, is, first of all, hopefully getting something started on the Syrian uh, track, uh, but also on the Iran uh, track. On Syria, um, it's a matter of judgment as to just how seriously Bibi Netanyahu is to be taken when he fulminates about the impossibility of Golan ever returning um, to um, uh, ever being uh, relinquished uh, back to Syrian rule, even though most objective observers for many years now have seen the, the Syrian deal as the most obviously doable of any of the pieces in the whole Middle East uh, equation. The only thing that, uh, the kindest thing I've actually heard said about uh, about Bibi, if I can put this semi off the record, is that the guy so lacks uh, any ideological or any other grounding principle that a deal is always possible um, for him um, <laughs> on just about anything at all, whatever he said. So let's, let's keep our fingers crossed. It's a rather fragile read on which to be basing confidence, but, uh, but there you go. Um, I actually may be a bit of an outrider in this respect. But I genuinely believe that in the case of Iran, a deal is doable, an acceptable deal is doable um, sooner rather than later. And I say this on the basis of visits to Tehran, many, many discussions with senior Iranian figures, including as recently a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago in Munich with Larajani, and just generally uh, trying to, to figure out what the dynamics of this. We can talk about this perhaps in more detail later, but. I think the elements of that deal involve essentially this, basically drawing a new red line which is realistically defensible, namely against any kind of move towards actual weaponization um, in Iran, rather than trying to hold the red line which has proved to be indefensible, and that is to wind back uh, to zero, uh, hopefully, um, Iran's fissile material production capability. That's just not going to be achievable. What I think it involves um, is the West taking a very deep breath, accepting the reality of that fissile material production capability, uh, maybe hoping realistically that it can be relatively contained at least over time before building up to industrial uh, dimensions and maybe ultimately multilateralized to some extent, but accepting the reality that eventually Iran is going to have breakout uh, capability based on that domestic manufacturing capability. But on the other side, uh, Iran accepting that it's got to be subjected to some very, very intrusive monitoring, verification, and other disciplines, and some implied disincentives of a more robust kind if it steps even a millimeter across that red line. My own judgment is that something which pulls together the threads in that particular way uh, is, in fact, doable. And, of course, if it is doable, it does mean, hopefully, a pretty fast-track move towards a more normalized relationship uh, between Iran and the rest of us in the neighborhood and elsewhere, which will have very positive implications for Afghanistan, for Iraq, for the Syria-Lebanon issues, for the Hamas and Hezbollah issues that flow in turn from that, and through all of that back into changing the basic psychological dynamics that are currently prevailing in the Israel-Palestine conflict and all the problems associated with Hamas and so on. Anyway, that's a quick take on what I think the world and this is certainly what I'm saying about Iran, is certainly based on many, many conversations with European uh, leaders and policy makers about how they see this thing moving forward. And I'm not just completely freewheeling on that one when I say that um, there's, a, there's a hope that the US will really, really very seriously um, engage, as it's showing signs of wanting to do on the Iranian track. On Afghanistan, Pakistan, which is worrying us all massively, I think the deepest concern uh, simply to ensure that there's no further deterioration 
in what is a pretty comprehensively awful situation. And I think the beginning of wisdom here is simply to acknowledge, as I understand Nayan Chanda did yesterday, just what a god-awful mess uh, this combination of interrelated problems in Afghanistan and Pakistan has proved to be. Um, in Afghanistan, we have a manifestly inadequate so far military operation against al-Qaeda and Taliban. We have very, very small development gains for the amount of money that's been spent, and they're all extremely fragile in terms of their sustainability. We have the drug uh, trafficking production um, system completely out of control. We have a corrupt and incompetent uh, national government with only very minor shards of light to some extent with the Afghan National Army, but certainly with no other institutions. And so far as the internationals are concerned, we have a conspicuous lack of coordination of anybody with anybody, whether it's civilian, civilian, in terms of the multiple players on that front and the development side, whether it's civilian to military or even internal military to military and a conspicuous lack of coordination of everybody internationally with the locals. So it's an unholy mess. In the case of Pakistan, we know that the border areas are out of control, that the military is at best divided and at worst hostile to fighting Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and its own domestic jihadis because of the Pakistan's military's traditional preoccupation with India. Uh, we have a civilian government which is deeply, hugely deserving of support in the abstract, but which is pretty hard to love uh, due to its corruption and general fecklessness and incompetence at most levels. Um, the most encouraging thing I've heard in recent times from the United States is a recognition that, Houston, we have a problem and um, that needs a fundamental rethinking of strategy and approach. I think the single most encouraging thing, if I can say this again, marginally off the record, is that um, my own conversation with uh, Dick Holbrook about this three weeks ago in Munich uh, saw me experience for the first time in my long, long association with Dick, a guy who seemed to be genuinely lacking in total confidence that he had the solution um, <laughs> to this particular problem. <laughs> And, and that, to me, is just a fantastically good sign about, uh, <laughs> about uh, how we're going to handle this particular uh, problem, because this is a guy, obviously, of huge competence and energy. Um, we're already seeing signs that after his uh, short visit there, he's getting rather more confidence about what the solution is, but we'll, we'll see how all this plays out. Um, the biggest problem is that there are multiple different objectives, as John Deutsch said, that are sort of jostling now for attention. I agree with him that the basic one simply has to be the denial of any capacity to Al-Qaeda to re-establish itself as a serious potential cause of terrorist uh, trouble to the rest of the world. I think everything else follows from that and is secondary to that. Although, of course, we all hope that the side benefit of creating an environment in Afghanistan which doesn't allow the resurgence of the Taliban to become again a willing harbour of Al-Qaeda type uh, violence, we all hope that a side benefit of that will to be to preserve such democratic and human rights gains as we've had, especially for women and girls, uh, because that is something that troubles us all. But there is a real danger in getting our priorities and objectives mixed up here, as has been said. Just a word next, and lastly, then after that, on two big thematic issues where I think the rest of the world is really, really interested in, in the US, seeing the US get this stuff right. And the first is this issue of response to mass atrocity crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, other major crimes against humanity, war crimes occurring in the context of essentially civil war. These are all issues, and John Deutsch again made the point in his reference to Rwanda, where the rest of the world really does want to see both a principled and a consistent United States uh, response and leadership. Responding to mass atrocity crimes was, of course, as you'll all remember, the controversial issue of the 1990s. There wasn't even the beginning of a consensus in international discourse between those who, on the one hand, led by Bernard Kouchner in France, who talked about humanitarian intervention, about the right to intervene, droit d'ingérence, 
This was a great rallying cry, right to intervene through coercive military action. This was a great rallying cry in the global north, but I'm afraid it didn't have much resonance at all in the global south, where many, many countries, particularly those newly joining the UN, were very, very proud of their sovereignty, determined to enforce respect for that, conscious of their fragility, and all too able to remember the many, many instances of overweening dominance, usually with a claim of a civilizing mission uh, by various colonial and imperial powers in their past. So we had this huge gulf and this huge standoff, which meant that there was a lamentable absence of consensus and a lamentable absence of effective international response when one after another those explosive, catastrophic human rights violation situations uh, came upon us uh, in the 90s. First of all, in Somalia, 93, then of course the, the horrible genocidal tragedy in Rwanda in 94, then almost unbelievably Srebrenica just a year later in 95 in, in the Balkans. And then a different kind of problem with Kosovo at the end of the decade, where even though the world led by the US did react to yet another uh, catastrophic emergence of um, indefensible ethnic cleansing and, and killing, uh, it did so without the support of the UN Security Council because of a threatened Russian veto. So you didn't have the legitimacy, the legal legitimacy, to, to justify that response. The breakthrough in all of this, putting it very quickly, I've written a whole book about this, so you have to keep me under control. Um, the breakthrough came with the invention, basically, of this concept of the responsibility to protect. Uh, with the Canadian Commission, which I co-chaired in 2001, which then rather miraculously, in the history of ideas, was translated into a unanimous consensual embrace by the UN General Assembly at the World Summit meeting in 2005, particularly miraculously since so little else was agreed at that summit, when the principle was accepted that yes, while the primary responsibility to protect its population from mass atrocity crimes does continue to rest with the sovereign government itself, Nonetheless, the international community has a responsibility to assist sovereign governments to discharge that responsibility when they've got real capacity problems and need that support. And thirdly, that when a sovereign state is manifestly failing to discharge that responsibility to protect its people from mass atrocity crimes, maybe because it itself is perpetrating them, then it's the responsibility of the wider international community to do something about that, preventively, if possible, by reaction short of military coercion, if possible, but ultimately through military coercion, if that's the only way to redress the evil. That breakthrough was hugely important, but we still have a hell of a long way to go in ensuring its practical and consistent application in practice. Kenya remains the best example in the last, just the last year of when you, you remember those atrocity crimes exploded after the contested election, almost out of a clear blue sky, people being burnt alive in churches reminiscent of Rwanda, tens of thousands of people being displaced on ethnic grounds in the Rift Valley. The world's reaction was, was astonishingly different uh, by comparison with the um, indifferent reaction uh, to Rwanda in '94. And there was a very successful mobilization of diplomatic effort, which actually produced a solution, which hopefully won't prove temporary, to the Kenya case. But Kenya remains about the only clear-cut example since, since 2005 of that kind of effective mobilization of response. And we've got the ongoing uh, problem in Darfur, problems in the Congo, problems still in Somalia, uh, all of which raise uh, fundamental responsibility to protect issues, and in other countries as well. Part of the problem is still misunderstanding about what the scope and limits of this doctrine is, and a misunderstanding which has unquestionably been helped along still by the enthusiasm of the US, and particularly Tony Blair in the UK, in characterizing the military invasion of Iraq in 2003 as being a responsibility to protect case aimed at addressing mass atrocity crime behavior or potential behavior from Saddam Hussein. On any view of it, and I won't stop to go through the, the reasoning, on any view of it, it was not such a case. It was a massive human rights case justifying international continued attention. There had been mass atrocity crimes, certainly in the past, 
but they weren't occurring or imminently about to occur in 2003 and applying any kind of reasonable criteria for coercive military intervention, they simply weren't satisfied. But the trouble is the Iraq case has had a continuing resonance, particularly in the global south and generating ongoing anxiety about what the hell the big boys are up to and what the dangers are of giving any kind of an open-ended principled mandate for this sort of intervention. Misunderstandings persist, some of them willful, contrived, utterly ungenuine, others of them genuine about just how, what the scope of this doctrine is. So without going into any more detail about that now, I just do want to say that I think it's very, very important that the US administration uh, picks up the pieces on this issue and gets this international debate uh, back on the rails where it needs to be. I think we're in very good hands in this respect with Samantha Power about to take on an important multilateral affairs job in the um, National Security Council the author of the great books on failure to response to, respond to genocide and so on in the past, with Susan Rice, now in the ambassadorial role in the UN. We have people here who get this, and Barack Obama himself gets it when he recently described genocide as a, as a stain on our souls, and if we stand idly by, that diminishes us all. And I think there's every reason to expect that that rhetoric will be translated into substantive action. But what I think the US needs to do are two things in particular. One, go to that UN debate, which is about to relaunch itself in a few weeks' time on this whole issue, and make clear, among many other things, that the Iraq invasion in 2003 was not an appropriate application of this particular doctrine. I think for the US to do that, in my own country, Australia, which was party to all that nonsense, and the UK as well to do it, would send a very important signal that and to get this debate back on the rails. And of course, what the US also needs to do is everything possible to resolve the ongoing violence of the situation in Darfur, uh, which continues to be a real blot on our consciences and a, a stain on any kind of effective behavior by the international community in terms of putting its money where its mouth is. I mean, just to take one example of how badly we're doing in Darfur, was identified about 18 months ago as needing, as the operation, the combined UN African Union operation, the civilian protection operation, which is occurring notionally with the consent of the Sudanese government. It was agreed about 18 months ago that that needed 26 helicopters at a minimum to be able to get the necessary mobility and protective effectiveness of this operation. 18 months later, just four of those helicopters have been supplied by the international community, even though, and I do this calculation in my book, there are in the international military inventories of the world currently 11,842 uh, helicopters which are potentially deployable. Now, you know, there just isn't a defense to that kind of reality. The final thematic issue on which I do want to say um, something is the issue of nuclear non-proliferation and disarm, because I think here the rest of the world, although this is not an issue which has had huge salience for either policymakers or publics in recent times, is starting rapidly to regenerate that salience, and the world is certainly looking to the US uh, for intelligent, responsible, and principled leadership. This whole issue of non-proliferation disarmament is one, frankly, in which the world has been sleepwalking for the last decade. Only the issues of Iran and North Korea really captured any kind of serious attention. Arms control negotiations, as many of you here have perhaps had a, a past in dealing with these things, have just slipped into complete desuetude. The bilateral stuff with the uh, US-Russia um, has just not been happening. The multilateral stuff in Geneva and elsewhere has not been happening. So we still have nearly 27,000 nuclear warheads in existence. We still have a very large proportion of those actively operationally deployed. And we still have a very large proportion of those on hair trigger alert, Cold War style, with the possibility of accidental uh, misuse, quite apart from deliberate misuse, uh, being very real. India and Pakistan um, have joined the ranks of the nuclear weapon states. Uh, with command and control arrangements as between them, which are very much less well developed, less sophisticated uh, than those that have traditionally existed between the US and Russia, and thus give us cause for concern. When I was in Islamabad uh, four weeks ago, I had a private conversation with a senior official saying, do you know that we actually agreed uh, between ourselves, India, Pakistan, to establish some fail-safe hotline mechanisms paralleling the US-Russia uh, agreement to just diminish the possibility of accidental miscalculations. 
uh, sort of things that can happen in a heightened tension situation. And do you know, he said, that since the Mumbai uh, bombing, which was generating huge bilateral tensions, only partially diffused since, do you know, he said, that there hasn't been a single phone call using that hotline, there hasn't been a single high-level political contact between the two sides? And this is the kind of problem we've got there. Plus, of course, the, the reality of the terrorist potential use uh, of these things, not only because we now know that there is at least one subset of terrorist population that has genuinely global uh, jihadi intentions, but also the, the question of capacity, capability. It's much more possible now with the internet, post-AQ Khan and the whole everything we know about the black market and what we know still about the amount of loose fissile material and loose mobile nuclear stuff that's lying around, not very well protected. All of this stuff is, is, is in the realm of reality, not science fiction, about a major terrorist incident um, using nukes occurring. So, I think the United States has a major responsibility to help pick up the pieces on this. The Bush administration was very keen on advancing a non-proliferation uh, agenda and did so very actively, and I, for one, my commission, for one, has no dispute about the emphasis that's been placed on strengthening the NPT regime, verification, compliance, and so on. But what's been missing is anything serious on the disarmament side of the equation, and there's no doubt that the rest of the world regards the weapons states as having a serious, serious obligation under the NPT, as well as more generally, morally, uh, to move steadily, significantly, persuasively towards disarmament. That hasn't happened. The United States has to, as a result, take some steps in the quite short term to get this debate back on the rails in the context of next year's 2010 non-proliferation uh, review, uh, review conference, but also more generally. I was in uh, Washington with my commission last weekend and had the occasion with my Japanese co-chair and Bill Perry joining us for several of these meetings to have a, a series of meetings with uh, Vice President Joe Biden, with um, Jim Jones and the National Security Council and his senior directors, with Jim Steinberg, Hillary's deputy in state, and the senior personnel that have been appointed, not too many of them so far there, uh, with in, at the Hill with John Kerry and the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Chair and Howard Berman, the House Foreign Relations Chair. So pretty full flush of the senior players. And I and my commission were arguing that, and I'll just list them without discussing them because I'm out of time, the particular priorities we think the US should have. One, CDBT ratification, acknowledging all the difficulties, of course, in the Senate. Hopefully the main senators will be their usual productive and helpful selves in, uh, in getting there over the next, uh, next 12 months. Uh, the issue of fissile material uh, production cutoff, that's fissile material that's capable of being used in nuclear weapons. There is sentiment out there that there should be a global treaty stopping any further production of that material. The US has been a stumbling block in the last few years to that negotiation even getting started. That stumbling block has to be withdrawn. Thirdly, as I've already mentioned, the US-Russia uh, movement fast on strategic force, deep reductions, and the follow-on to start in the Moscow Treaty, sort as it's called. The wide-ranging strategic dialogue being initiated earlier rather than later with both Russia and China on nuclear-related issues, quite apart from strategic issues more generally. And fifthly, we urged as a priority serious, serious attention to the issue of nuclear doctrine in the context of the nuclear posture review and getting away from where we've got to with the Bush administration where nukes have been identified as permissibly usable, not only as is defensible in response to the use or potential use of nuclear weapons by other countries against the US or its allies, but the way it's written at the moment, nukes are potentially available to deal with chemical threats, biological threats, conventional threats, terrorist threats by states, non-state actors, and sisters, cousins, and aunts uh, elsewhere. It's, it's just absolutely open-ended, and this sends absolutely the wrong set of messages. And uh, I don't know how much rearguard resistance, probably quite a lot there'll be from the Pentagon and others on, uh, on this particular issue, but it's very, very important uh, that attitudes change. The short point to make about my conversations uh, a week ago, is that I felt I was really pushing, we were really pushing on an open door. 
you have conversations, you have statutory conversations, you have real conversations uh, with people in this business, and these were real conversations with people who are really genuinely committed to turning this around. And I found that just tremendously encouraging, in particular the message that was coming through, that the commitment here really does start at the top. The President Obama himself gets it, not least as a result of his extended association with Dick Lugar during his time in the Senate, gets it, really wants to do something about it, sees this as an issue right up there in global significance terms with the economic meltdown and the climate issue, and that we are going to see some movement. So just finally, um, in conclusion, on all these issues, the proof of the pudding is, of course, going to be um, in the eating. Priorities um, do have to be sustained, even those that have been tentatively marked out at the moment. Uh, the urgent, as we all know, does tend to drive out the important uh, when you're in government. There are bound to be mistakes and misjudgments along the way. There's possibly the, the, uh, the possibility of some erosion of the authority of this new government if the economic stuff doesn't turn around pretty quickly. But the Obama administration really does start worldwide with a huge reservoir of goodwill. I can tell you, the Australian, I don't know what they were in the United States at the end of it, but the Australian opinion polls were running five to one in his favour um, throughout the campaign. And that the, the truth of the matter is that the prospect of an Obama presidency has had grown foreign policy specialists going weak at the knees um, all around the, around the world. I haven't, been, uh, I haven't been entirely immune from that um, condition myself, and I suspect there's just one or two here that might also have been uh, in that condition. My hope, simply, my very final word, is that in a year or two, we won't all be afflicted with that same old weary cynicism which does tend to overcome us in this matter. I think not, I'm confident, but we're sure as hell gonna to have to work at it to assume that the, to guarantee that that course is stayed. Thank you.